painful position, but I think rewarding one. I had to explain to my biology teachers why they were doing me and my fellow students a severe disservice by advocating creationism over evolution. And when I was doing it, I had to, they always asked me how it began. And I gave them several theories, but I made it clear to them that we don't really know. Um, but I'd like to be able to give them a little bit better answer. Could you maybe say, do you, do you think there are any specific theories that are more plausible than others? Maybe the RNA world hypothesis over something else? Well, I, I'm shocked to hear your story of what you were taught. Um, and uh, I would very much like to see that state of affairs changed. And I think that's probably a political thing that has been done. I think that means that people have to don't you have things called local school boards where we can get elected? Um, please go and get elected to local school boards and do something about that. <laughs> now you ask about the origin of life, which is, which is what preceded evolution. Um, evolution gets going once genetics is in existence. Once you have DNA or something like DNA, it doesn't have to be DNA, um, which is an accurate replicator of coded information. Once that happens, then natural selection is very likely to follow. That's the first step, which I think must be met for life anywhere in the universe. Now, DNA does the job now, but DNA is what's been called a high-tech replicator, very unlikely to come about by sheer luck. We are now looking for something that will come about by sheer luck. DNA is not it. DNA is extremely good at self-replication, but it needs protein. Uh, the, the executive functions of living cells are carried out by proteins, functioning as enzymes, catalyzing chemical reactions, and specifying which chemical reactions shall go on. So we have these two great partners in life. DNA, which is the replicator, protein, which is the executive. And each one is very good at its job and completely useless at the other. There is a catch-22 of the origin of life, which is that you can't have DNA functioning as a replicator without protein, and you can't have protein without DNA to specify the sequence of amino acids. You mentioned the RNA world theory. RNA, which is like DNA but not quite, uh, is a moderately good replicator and a moderately good enzyme, a moderately good catalyst. RNA, in other words, can do both jobs. And the RNA world theory is a very interesting one because it proposes that the original progenitor was RNA, which did both jobs, both the replication job later taken over by DNA and the executive job later taken over by, by protein. And I, I think that probably the answer to your question is that of all the available theories at the moment, the RNA world is the one that seems to be the most, the most promising. But your ex-teachers, or whoever it was you were arguing with, should not need to have a theory of the origin of life in order to know that their alternative is total baloney, because... <laughs> is how we explain the vast complexity, as I introduced my talk, of life. And evolution does that. If you are going to postulate a designer to fill the gap, the gap of the origin of life or any other gap, if you're going to postulate a designer who deliberately designed it, then you are postulating something that already has the property of being, of being complex and and therefore cannot possibly be a satisfactory answer to the riddle. The riddle has got to be answered by a gradual process of slow incremental steps. And that's what uh, science is working on. We've got most of the way there. We still have a gap at the very beginning and we're still working on that. Thank you very much. Dr. Dawkins. Very exciting to be in the same room with you tonight. I, uh, my name is Joshua Goins, 
and I am a student from Brescia University. It is a small Catholic university in Owensboro, Kentucky, and I prefer the magic of reality. Thank you. Recently, in the blogosphere on the internet, uh, with the release of your new book, and in the last couple of days in America, but longer uh, from across the pond, you have been accused of being soft. Uh, and I somewhat understand where people are coming from, because it was your videos on militant atheism that first convinced me to out myself to my very religious family and friends. Uh, after, uh, after looking through your book the past couple of days, I do appreciate that you have grabbed from a plethora of myths from around the world and throughout the ages and have focused on each of them only briefly as not to give any one uh, too much clout or too much weight. But in retrospect, I do think that perhaps it seems that you might have treaded lightly around the Jesus the, the Christ myth of his healing and uh, avoiding mentioning Muhammad by name. How yes, well, um, it's not often that I'm accused of not being strident enough. <laughs> it's, it makes quite a nice change, actually. Um, I, what I wanted to do was to um, not actually denigrate the myths necessarily, but to uh, begin each chapter with myths because they are rather wonderful. And, and I think a lot of people, I positively wanted people to know that Australian Aboriginal myths, ancient Egyptian myths, um, Inca myths, Aztec myths, uh, Norse myths are wonderful. And I think I wanted to undermine the Judeo-Christian myth, not by directly attacking it, but by showing that it's just one among thousands of myths. And the children, the young people who read my book, should I hope realize uh, that there is nothing special about the Judeo-Christian myth in which they happen to have been brought up by their parents or by their Sunday school teachers. And you, you notice how I told the, the Noah's Ark myth, but changed it to Utnapashtim um, from the Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, which is an older myth and obviously the one from which the Noah myth has been, has been, been derived. Um, that also is supposed to convey the same message that um, Myths are extremely widespread, and there's nothing special about the myth in which you happen to have been brought up, whichever one that happens to be. May I ask uh, Dr. Dawkins, is willing to take more questions. We're going to have three more questions. And please pose your questions directly. So, <laughs> uh, after this, uh, Professor Dawkins and uh, Mr. Sean Fred Fred uh, is going to take part in the book assignment. It's a long day for them. Uh, so, yes, it is. hi, my name is Chris Booth. I'm a student at the University of Kentucky. And this summer, I was browsing the internet, and I came across this article on like on National Geographic's website, where these scientists were looking at a, I think it was a radiation map of the universe, and they noticed like, abrasions in like, parts of it, and they kind of hypothesized that that might lead to proof of an existence of like an alternate universe. So my, que my question, or like a series of questions would be, um, what are your thoughts as a, an esteemed scientist on the possible existence of multiverses or the multiverse idea. Right, this is a very interesting idea which some, which quite a number of physicists are now uh, entertaining. It, the idea that the universe that we can see, the universe that we, that we believe began with the Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago, is only one universe among many, and they sometimes speak of a bubbling foam of universes, in which our universe is just, is just one bubble. There is some evidence for this, I understand, that you'd have to talk to a physicist. One of the things that the multiverse theory is used to explain is the fact which some physicists allege, which is that the, the fundamental constants of physics, sort of half dozen or so irreducible numbers that uh, they have no explanation for but simply accept as numbers, that these numbers had to be the way they are, or very close to the way they are, or the universe, as we know it, could not have come into existence, could not have, or rather, could not have lasted long enough, say, to produce life. Um, 
So the multiverse theory is used in the following way. Um, each of the different universes in the bubbles um, has a different set of laws and constants, and only a tiny minority of them have the properties needed to give rise to us, and we, by definition, have to be in one of that, in that minority. That's known as the anthropic principle. Um, it's a very interesting idea, but you need to talk to a physicist to get an authoritative answer. said that the purpose of life is to hydrogenate carbon dioxide. Um, this seems to imply that the life was, that uh, the first prokaryotic scale, or perhaps a series of them, were born out of a state of disequilibrium between the uh, certain elements in the environment of Earth. Um, what are your thoughts on the implications for that in uh, that alone as an idea, but also in other worlds and other solar systems as well? You're not going to get a very well-informed answer from me on that. That's a, that. I said the last question was a question for a physicist. This is a question for a chemist, uh, which I'm not, and perhaps you are. Uh, and uh, so, given that we've only got um, two more questions, one more, one more question, and we haven't got time, I think I'm, I would just be waffling if I tried to answer that. Sorry. <coughs> Sorry about that, that's a lot better. Um, Dr. Dawkins, do you think it's important for us to distinguish between the idea of like technological singularity in the near future as useful speculative science, or just 21st century eschatology? Well, I, I take it you're referring to Ray Kurzweil. Yes, sir. There. Um, and um, when we look, when futurologists look at the future and they extrapolate current trends like Moore's law, whereby computing power um, increases uh, exponentially and the doubling time is, I forget what it is, but it's something very, very short. Um, you can um, extrapolate to the point where something very strange, a sort of singularity, uh, happens. This is futurology, this is science fiction, uh, it's interesting speculation, and I, I'm interested in that sort of speculation, but I wouldn't have any kind of very well-informed answer to give. I like science fiction, but that's what it is. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.